Uh, I'm Jim Collins. I'm uh, chair of the history department, and I want to welcome you to our annual Richard Stites lecture by Julian Schwartz from Potsdam. Uh, I thought I'd say a couple of words about my old friend and former colleague Richard Stites. Uh, and before uh, I introduce Michael David Fox, who we hired to replace uh, Richard. Richard was born in 1931. He died in Helsinki in 2010. He came to Georgetown in 1977. Um, he published his first book shortly after that, The Women's Liberation Movement in Russia. And I know from talking with Richard, he had a lot of problems selling this book to publishers because no one could possibly be interested in women's history in the 1970s. Um, and it was really a path-breaking book. His second major book was a book which I've always thought was, if not the best, one of the two or three best books ever published by any of my colleagues, uh, Revolutionary Dreams, Utopian Vision and Experimental Life in the Russian Revolution, which won the Vucinich Prize in 1989-90. The Times Higher Education Supplement called it a dazzling compendium of the manifold ideas and projects that flashed across Russia after 1917. And it certainly is. He published many things after that on Russian popular culture. He wrote a book on surf theater companies in the 19th century. And at his death, he was working on a book uh, about post napoleonic Europe, which came out after his death. Now, Richard was quite a character. He never had a driver's license. Imagine an American would never had a driver's license. Um, he taught and lived in the rural Midwest. I always wondered how he survived that without a car. Uh, he was, uh, as Professor Spendlow can attest, uh, an active singer and pianist. And I still remember nights of him down at Mr. Smith's on M Street. They had a piano and Richard, after he had a few drinks, would go over there and play popular songs uh, and sing. And he was terrific. He was also an innovative teacher, and I learned a lot of things from him and stole plenty of his ideas from my own classes. His PhDs teach at universities like Cambridge, Michigan, University of Puerto Rico, small colleges like Dickinson College, really all over. He was one of the great producers of uh, historians of 20th century Russia. And I'm going to borrow one statement from Richard before I'll ask, I have to go to another meeting that I have to be as chair of the department, uh, which is taking place right now. And this is a quotation from Richard talking about popular culture, which I think fits in with today's uh, session. Popular culture is part of history because it is much a human experience as war, slavery, revolution, and work. It is what most people create and consume in their spare time. Looking at its themes and styles is the best way to undercover values held by millions of people about life, love, friendship, success, and the outer world. And with that, I will turn you over to Michael David Fox. did a bunch in the mirror, but I cannot recreate the, um, the mischievous grin that he had when he said, you dirty rat. But he would often follow that up with a joke. Did you hear the one about the Swede, the Norwegian, and the Finn who were sitting around a table with a bottle of vodka? And the Swede says, Skål. And the Norwegian says, Skoll. And the Finn looks at them and said, do we come here to talk or to drink? <laughs> and you might be thinking that about all this, these introductions, but I'm going to take um, a few minutes to introduce Nina first, because it's really such a great pleasure to introduce her here 
when the original lecture was planned for March of 2020, and just, I don't remember what, but something interfered with that. Um, and so this is actually a biennial lecture, and we haven't had one since 2018. So Juliana is giving the fourth Richard Stites lecture. She comes to us from the Center of Contemporary History in Potsdam, where she heads the Department of Communism and Society. And if you think about the first three Stites lectures, the first one was delivered by Alfred, Alfred Reber, who was a giant founder of the post-war uh, uh, field of Russian Soviet studies and a contemporary of Richard. Um, and the next two were by two of Richard's most prominent students, um, Herbertus Jan and Jeff Weinlinger. Liana comes to us not with a personal connection to Richard, but I think the reason she's here is because she is, her work is all about uh, one of the great endeavors of Richard Stice's scholarship, which is, I would say, a cultural history that's both politically relevant and has a strong connection to empirically informed social history. And in my view, Juliana first is doing the kind of next generation, cutting edge form of cultural history that continues in a way what Richard was doing. Um, and I think that were he alive today, he would be thrilled to engage with it. First of all, let me just point out a, a certain coherence to Yuliana's vision of 20th century Russian Soviet history. In her first book, Stalin's Last Generation, Yuliana examined Soviet youth under late Stalinism, but in a pluralistic fashion. She was looking at you know, fashion mongers and hooligans, true believers and doubters uh, as you know, um, friends and lovers because all her work has an important gender dimension. And she interpreted this post-war Stalin era generation of youth, basically late 40s, early 50s, as, a pi as pioneering a new phenomenon different from the 1920s and 30s and the war years. And to quote from that work, quote, Soviet people did not confront the system, they bypassed it. So, and already that's one thing that you'll see continued in her later work. Already in her first book, Yuliana was both looking at a certain Soviet specificity in post-war youth culture, but also more generally at the forces of modernity. She was incorporating even then an international, transnational comparative and global dimension. So during the Cold War, Russian Soviet history was often riveted on sort of exceptionalism and sui generis patterns. Yuliana's more cosmopolitan brand of cultural history has continued, especially in her most recent book on Soviet hippies, Flowers Through Concrete, which I noticed is now out in paperback, and in her current sort of mega project on Perestroika from below. Uh, in Flowers Through Concrete, she began injecting a strong dose of oral history, which using, I think, over 100 interviews and many private archives uh, in this book. To me, it also seems that she pulled off a kind of an anthropological fieldwork, actually entering into the personal networks of these former ex-Soviet hippies. And I think that's given her a great deal of insight into post-Soviet Russia and into Putin-era realities. And in this book, um, she came to another noteworthy and innovative conclusion. And I'm going to quote again. The land of Soviet hippies and the world of late socialism were not entirely incompatible, but in fact meshed surprisingly well. So this is a brand of cultural history that is capable of generating those kinds of insights. Uh, the title of her talk is today, Why Soviet Hippies, The Great Escape, Why Soviet Hippies Do Not Change. introduction. Um, I'm very glad you didn't make a precondition to imitate Richard Stites of your Stites lecturers. <laughs> I think bearing my chest would have been <laughs> more difficult. Um, I have actually met Richard uh, only once. Um, it was in Berlin in 2005 at the International Congress of Eastern European Studies and um, he was sitting in an open-air cafe holding court uh, for the entire afternoon, his <laughs> earrings sparkling in the afternoon Son. Um, 
and of course I was accompanied by several uh, cocktails. Um, of course, however, I knew him well before that. Um, the book which was for me most inspirational was his work on wartime popular culture, which I used a lot in my, my first book on, on Stalin's last um, generation. Um, and the fact that somebody could approach um, wartime society from such an angle, um, and Soviet society in general, where even the scrapes of um, the most marginal people and what they produced in terms of culture was important, remained an inspiration and was an inspiration for this book on Soviet hippies as uh, well. As uh, Michael said, the lecture was initially thought to be a March 2020 lecture, which was then sort of a lecture about the almost finished manuscript. Um, and uh, little did we know that when the lecture was actually going to happen, uh, Russia would be a wartime society um, as well. And I sort of felt I, I didn't want to come and um, to speak about um, Soviet hippies as if nothing has happened. So, the talk has become a little bit um, a sort of meandering and wandering of um, what happens um, in, in Russia these days and why do things happen as they happen, uh, which of course um, still remain a mystery even to those of us who spent a long time looking or living in this country. Um, so during the times of so-called criminologies, observers would try to gauge the importance of various actors by seeing who stood where on the mausoleum during big barrel raids. Um, well, that gives some clues about the elite. The people who marched underneath remained largely a mystery, not to speak of the people who were not visible on such days. From time to time, there would be a spark of mass action, like Nova Cherkask, 1962, or Kaunas, 1972, of which I will speak later, and then, of course, Moscow, 1991, and the failed putsch. But in general, what Soviet society thought remained a mystery right up to the very end um, of the country they lived in and beyond. These days, despite social media and increased mobility, we are not that much, this much further. The debate if the invasion of Ukraine is Putin's or Russia's war is fought heatedly in all kinds of forums, not least among Russian emigrants themselves who, while knowing their own motivations, are suspicious of the person who came or arrived later. In whatever former Soviet Republic or the West, they are now uh, trying to order their thoughts. Those who stayed back in Russia and opposed the war are scathing about those who ran either in March uh, to achieve distance or in October to escape mobilization. Those whose parents and friends are affirming the support for Putin and his policies are puzzled and dismayed, but are rarely vocal about their views, while those who seem to go to set rallies seem to often have been bust in from the workplace, yet refuse to condemn their presence as shambles. In general, a great who of silence is once again resting over Russian society, leaving all interpretations open. What does this all have to do with Soviet hippies, you may ask? That uh, unexpected entity of Western counterculture in a society that was keen on the mobilization of all culture and activism for official purposes. My argument is a lot. Understanding the practices and behavior patterns within Soviet society of Soviet hippies is not only about understanding the margins of Soviet society. It is also understanding the mechanisms of the society as a whole, which in the extreme case of hippies are highlighted like experiments in a test tube. Hippies were not outliers of late socialism. They were an integral part of it, reflecting its inner workings while at the same time shaping them. Understanding Soviet hippies' relationship with the politics of their time and the Soviet system as their habitat makes visible the survival mechanisms that were employed by late Soviet society as a whole. Precisely because their reliance on a Western model and precisely because they chose to take matters further than the average Soviet subject, they make visible what was more hidden by the large rest of society. In other words, just as we learn a lot about a state by looking at, at how it treats its weakest or its enemies, we learn a lot about a society by looking at those that are more exalted and more extravagant in their behavior and hence elicit a stronger response from the state. As I will argue more detail at the end of this lecture, despite all that has happened in the last 30 years, the learned practices of late socialism still govern much of today's social action and inactions. Especially in Russia, where an increasingly dictatorial regime has stifled and an narrative citizen and a narrative of citizens' power. While richer, at least in the urban areas, and more cosmopolitan in relation to power and money, many Russians have resorted back to well-known strategies of survival and carving out private spaces in face of a system they feel they cannot control nor influence. If you substitute the party with money and influence and the Soviet system with Putin's framework of controlled democracy, we end up with a qualitatively different 
but structurally very similar setup to late socialism. Indeed, I would argue the similarity is one of the appeals of Putinism. To look at the inner workings of late socialism is hence not only an exercise of excavating a lost civilization, but a way to get a handle on understanding how Russian society responds to the development now and over the last 20 years. At the heart of the Soviet hippie project, which I studied for so long, was what I want to term the Great Escape. Unlike dissidents, Soviet hippies were anti-Soviet as a mood or lifestyle, but not necessarily as a form of activism. This meant that the Soviet hippie movement was extraordinarily successful in carving out spaces within the Soviet system that ran parallel, alternative, or even counter to official spaces. I will start with a little bit of hippie history. Starting in about 1967, hippies started to appear in almost all Soviet cities with large communities especially in the Baltic town, so um, I have a short run through here of the early hippie communities. Here is Leningrad 1966, Tallinn 1967, um, a guy who later on became famous for tailoring jeans. These are his first products, I think they improved. Um, Love Street and Kaunas in 1967, um, a similar group in Palanga in 1969 in their whole hippie primary. In Kaunas in 1971, um, there's a fountain which becomes to prominence later on, and I'll talk about that later. In Moscow in 1970, um, appropriately assembled under Engels and uh, Marx and Lenin. Um, in Lviv 1974, actually existed a hippie community much earlier. And in Riga in 1976, and finally in Ufa in 1980. So this is just a brief uh, run through of hippie communities that existed. The large number of hippie communities, which often started out as a kind of Beatles fan club, as was obvious in the first picture, which actually, interestingly, I cannot help to tell you this, the first picture of Leningrad, on the other side of that wall lived Vladimir Putin. Um, it's, uh, the, Leningrad's main hippie grew up in the same house as, as Vladimir Putin and played, played together with him in the sandpit. But um, the development from then on was different. <laughs> So, the leader was Soviet newspapers that introduced Soviet, hippie, Soviet youngsters to hippiedom. So already in 1967, um, Pravda ran an editorial called Hippie et Rogier, Hippie and Others. And later on, um, the year afterwards, uh, came a very famous article called um, Travels into the Hippie Land, um, which was already um, written by somebody in America, a Russian correspondent, Bar um, yeah, Baravik, um, who own children had already fallen for the hippie creed in um, America. Um, so Pravda by Kumsveta Razvesnik uh, thought that anti-capitalist, anti-Vietnam counterculture could provide another avenue of reporting, um, of um, reporting how the uh, Western society was falling apart. Um, for some reasons, nobody thought at the time that the movement could take off in their own country, especially since their reports and pictures provided a well-sourced how-to-do um, element. When hippies appeared locally, official instructions of how to deal with them were absent. Um, it just wasn't previewed um, in the canon. So some regional bosses, such as, for example, the ones in Latvia, already had a nasty tutorial in Latvia, uh, in the Latvian uh, newspaper about local hippies. Um, most um, uh, authorities remained silent. And in fact, any kind of um, reporting that was only amplified the knowledge circulating among youth who staged first happenings and love ends in the middle of Riga already in 1968, so that was the consequence of that first editorial. For most places, however, the late 1960s and early 1970s were a period when boundaries were pushed only with little resistance. Being a hippie did not mean being anti-Soviet at this time, even though a certain disenchantment with official youth culture formed the basis of it. In many ways, the lines between official dam and hippie activity were then not sharply drawn. While a large number of youth saw hippies mainly as a fun vehicle to hear better music, feel cool among their peers, and showcase their studiously fashioned style, there were some people among the hippies who considered the movement not the antithesis to official youth culture, but rather a vehicle of rejuvenation. The idea was not as crazy as it might sound now. There had been previous grass rejuvenation attempts for the Komsomol, the Soviet youth organization. Some actually had made it into the Komsomol official sphere, not least the so-called tourist movement, which was a movement of um, people going on expedition, which started out as a grassroots movement and then got incorporated into the Komsomol 
and several ecological movements, um, especially in Siberia, people saving the cedar trees, uh, which became, was first condemned and then incorporated, um, and other local groups. The idea to use the dynamics of the newly emerging hippies as a vehicle to reform the stale and aging official youth organization was on the mind of at least one Soviet hippie. And that Soviet hippie happened to be the most popular and most influential person in all of Moscow. His name was Yura Borokov, but he was better known as Sonse, the sun. And he was shining the light, the shining light of the Moscow, so-called uh, Centralia Systema, the Central Systema, the Central System, um, which was what the Soviet hippies or what the Moscow hippies initially um, called their own people. Because Moscow was big, it in fact had several uh, systemas. Um, it had the Baumanskaya, the Fronsenskaya, the Smalovskaya system, but the most important one was the Centrovaya, uh, which was um, led by Borakov and assembled right in the middle of town um, in several locations, one of which was um, the courtyard of the Moscow State University, so called Psychodurum, and the other one was the Mayakovskaya, which has been before already a point of youth assembling and reading poetry in the 1950s and 60s. The term Systema as such, which is also attributed to Sonse as his creator, was already an indication that here was someone at work whose ambitions were high. It was chosen as a term to be a direct challenge, an alternative to the official system, also called Systema in slang terms. Sonse was the offspring of a minor army family. Unlike many of his friends, such as Stas Namen, who was the grandson of Anastas Mikoyan, or Vasya Stalin, who was the grandson of Stalin, um, Sonse did not have protection from high above. His father had been discharged early after a career in the border guards, which saw him posted in Crimea and Yerevan. A staunch believer in the Soviet state, father and son clashed violently and repeatedly with Jura, desperately seeking his father's with Jura desperately seeking his father's approval. A fact that is evidenced in the many short stories Jura wrote on the subject of father and son relations later on. While Borokov Sr. was not into rock and roll and fancy clothing, and while Borokov Jr. started his career as a Fatsovshik, a black market trader, in essence they had one idea in common, that life had to serve a higher purpose, be guided by an idea of justice and responsibility, and ironically, live up to communist ideals. Yours also got it into his head that Moscow needed an anti-Vietnam demonstration, just like American youth. Maybe he had been inspired by the May 1 demonstrations in Washington, D.C. in 1971 here, which were covered widely in the Soviet press, not least because their brutal police breakdown. In terms of content, there was no problem. The Soviet Union was very critical of America's involvement in Vietnam. In terms of style, an independent demonstration, there was a huge problem. The unlucky Euro fell into a KGB trap. He got permission by Moscow, Mos by Mosoviet, the Moscow um, city administration, but it was a ruse to track down anybody affiliated to hippies. Supposedly on the 1st of June 1971, up to 3,000 people were incarcerated and rounded up and sent to the police stations. The tragedy was that unlike American youngsters, Yura did not want to show opposition, but indeed alignment of Soviet hippies with the Soviet norms. It is unclear how many of Yuva's thousands of friends and acquaintances shared this vision, but they were not adverse enough to, to its underlying idea as to agree to participate in Euro's grand peace that was to show that hippies could be, quote, useful. After the rest and time spent in psychiatric hospital, Euro wrote a short story about the events, and I'm going to read you from my book a short section of it. Finally, we could show, so Jura had this, a funny habit of writing of him in the third person. Finally, we could show that we are far from being hooligans who are wasting their free time. Instead, we are normal people like all the rest, that we are interested in the life of the country and of the whole world. Maybe this is a bit of a big claim, but in any case, we do not want to stand aside and look at what is happening only as observers. Let the people know that even long-haired youngsters are capable of things worthy of human beings. So you can see he's quite far from being an oppositionist at that moment. But you insisted on giving the Soviet endorsed peace message his way. He said, many people always speak for us, but we want to say it ourselves. We don't want to be spoken for. And that was, of course, exactly his problem. But Moscow was not alone in raising its voice in 1971. The hippies of Grodna were one step further, 
They did not demonstrate, oh, this is actually, sorry, this is the um, um, handwritten uh, short story of which I just quoted you. And this is Jura Sonze after the um, um, demonstration, after he came out of the psychiatric hospital, and I think you can see a little bit the disillusionment that has set in. But the hippies of Gerudna were a step further. They did not demonstrate for peace or against war in a land far away. They demonstrated for themselves. After they and visiting friends had been roughed up by local police, so Gerudna, by the way, is in Belarus, and the next week, on August 11, also 1971, they organized a protest against their treatment. They um, called out for justice for hippies. They were roughed up even more severely. Their leader, Misha Gulenin, was paid, uh, was here in the center, was paraded on local television with the words, don't be afraid, this is not Masha, a female name, this is Misha. He feminized himself. More consequential were the Kaunas and Nepotizhinsk riots. In the first, a long, young, long-haired man burned himself near the local hippie meeting spot, which was the fountain I showed um, in a, one of the pictures initially, and also happened to be right opposite the party headquarters in Kaunas. On his funeral day, riots broke out. As we can see here, and in fact, the riots lasted for several days. This is a KGB picture. You can see the people being numbered. Um, above, you can see a little bit of uh, the enormous crowds, but there were many, many more. In fact, it took three days, and the army to restore order. And the second one, I don't have any pictures. Um, it was a, a riot for, uh, by workers um, and also caused several days of, of rioting in a, in a minor town in, in Ukraine um, and the army had to be called in to um, keep calm. And all of these things were, of course, were frightening spectacles for the authorities who learned that youth subculture and politics had to be kept apart. Especially because in Lithuania, in, in Kaunas, then um, it initially was also calls for the freedom of hippies, and then very quickly came into calls for the freedom of Lithuania. So made that jump into nationalist sentiments, and uh, also nationalists, of course, uh, ended up being on the streets um, and in fact providing the arms that were um, in Kaunas. But it's also a frightening experience for the hippies involved, who mostly learned their hard way what it meant to cross the Soviet state on the political field. After 1971 and 1972, repressions increased and a central directive was ushered via the Komsomol that local hippies had to be fought by all means and circulated among regional secretaries. The number of people who considered themselves to be hippies and were prepared to show it dropped dramatically. However, what emerged was a hardier varietal of hippie, a professional hippie, someone who was prefer prepared to suffer for their visions of a life well lived. In that respect, they did not differ from the dissidents who a few years earlier had gone through a similar process of professionalization. But unlike dissidents, Soviet hippies now directed all their energy not towards engagement with the state, but towards disengagement. The parallel world they built up from now on was a world that was designed to have as little touch point with the official Soviet world as necessary. Soviet hippies became masters of the great escape. And as such, they actually achieved an impact on society, the one Sonsa had desired but rather than rejuvenation of the Soviet project, they showcased a way out of it. A way how to live with it without confronting it. Ultimately, the strategy proved to be more corrosive than outright dissent. Not least because late socialism allowed so many roots of the great escape. Dutchers, garages, fishing, scientific expeditions, personal love stories, and many things more. Soviet hippies were only a small part of this bigger story, but they both provided a model as well as a path-breaking function. They pushed the boundaries of the Great Escape to its very limits, signaling how far a Soviet citizen could go before being reprimanded. Let's have a look at the closer uh, mechanisms of this Great Escape. The first one is physical. Um, after the demonstration and crackdowns, hippies started to look for alternative to the big urban centers, where both surveillance and policing was particularly strong. The Eureka moment came in 1975, after a band of Moscow hippies joined a sanctioned exhibition of non-conformist artists under the leadership of Oscar Rabin. That was since they were known as the group Wallacey or Hair, and they caused a scandal with some of their works, most notably a hippie flag. The big scandal, however, was because they agreed to an interview by somebody who might be known in this town, Arthur Franklin Jr., um, now, a, I think, still alive, um, 
well-known journalist um, who then was working for Newsweek and interviewed them. And when the article was published, um, the group was um, advised to leave town. They went down to the Crimea, um, to the house of the artist Yuri Kisilov, um, who owned a house there in the winter, so not quite as nice as it might sound. Interestingly, the item that had caused the furore for, uh, and in fact, meant the um, confiscation of the flag was not the poppy, which is symbolizing drugs, um, not the guitar or the jeans or um, the the endless concert, the, uh, the never-ending day, but it was the crossed-out border sign, um, which then says um, "country without borders." And the visiting uh, official said there can never be a country without borders, um, and he was told, "But comrade, uh, under communism, surely there wouldn't be any borders." Um, and he insisted that even under communism uh, there would be borders and confiscated um, the flag. So uh, one can see that actually um, the, um, the idea of, of, of a physical escape of no borders of a borderless country was uh, something that avoided the authorities more than the drugs um, or the Western youth culture that is also symbolized by this picture. Part of the great escape was the realization that the Soviet state was at its weakest when people were on the move. Together with the youthful quest to push personal boundaries, the trusser became the great identifier. To be on the trusser, to hitchhike and to meet friends who can be told about the adventures of the trussers became the most important heavy ritual. The trusser became a summer ritual with a strict calendar from June the 1st to September the 1st, because these are the, roughly the Soviet school holidays and when the theaters were closed and the art schools uh, where hippies used to work. Because Soviet cities had to work, but they worked in jobs where they could get the summer off or where they could just leave and not work for the allowed two months. Soon a hippie trail was developing that ran between Moscow and Leningrad into the Baltics and further to western Ukraine and into the south with the Crimea featuring strongly. What we can see from the KGB documents available, so that's the Ukrainian KGB archive, the authorities struggled to keep track of them. When they had just spoiled one happy meeting in the Crimea, they knew that the crowd was moving to Lviv to celebrate Jamie Hendrick's birthday, but news did never travel fast enough to spoil that meeting too. Hippies on the move were literally outside the grip of the Soviet system. And here I just have a few pictures of hippies on the move. Um, so it was either hitchhiking or freight trains. And they went as far as the Altai, Central Asia, here in Samarkand. Um, sometimes they had to stay a night in the police station. This is a photo taken after they had spent a night in a police station at Lake Pepsi in Estonia. Um, and finally, they got into the idea of creating summer camps in uh, far-flung places. Um, so this is um, Sonnenschneue, which is near Leningrad, and this is uh, Gawa, which became the most famous of all hippie camps. Um, and here is a, a picture of a so-called people's book, and I think the slogan uh, gives you a little bit of a flavor of what the idea behind all of this was. It says, better to work tomorrow than today. Um, of course, um, turning upside down the Soviet creed of that work ennobles you. It was the second generation of Soviet hippies who found a fixed space to live their alternative life. Gawa, a river valley near the Riga home of hippie Misha Bombin, became the site of a summer camp. So this is this one here. Uh, thousands of hippies passed through it every year. Here hippies cooked together, slept together, worshipped together, read together, and then for a few weeks every summer forgot that they lived in the Soviet Union. The authorities came from time to time to check passports, but unlike previous locations, they did not evict hippies from their camp. It was as if the Soviet authorities had accepted that the escape into the camp was better than permanent escapes into the unknown. Just as the rock club in Leningrad and the Club 81 for poets, Gawa became one of the permitted escapes of the Soviet Union, together with duchess and their gardens, garages and the men toiling in them and basements for bodybuilders which took off in Lubertsy around the time, soon spawning another escapist youth subculture. Misha Bombin himself recounts the train journey between Riga and Tallinn, in which a drunken KGB officer told him that Tallinn had been designated the Sioux for people like him, like a reservation, he was told. Indeed, in the late 1970s, the KGB had initiated several structural changes which showed that it had learned the potential of the great escapes happening among youth. The new director at Six for Subculture adopted a curating rather than a repressive function, which also worked as a divide and rule mechanism. So for example, some rock groups were permitted and others were not, some hippies were allowed to exist and others were not. 
and while others were relegated to the unstable underground. Divergence, not eradication, was the goal. Hippies, however, were not content with mere physical escapes. Their true escape was hence not the travel on the trusser, which ironically made them very knowledgeable connoisseurs of the Soviet Union, better than many bureaucrats. So, for example, here you have a picture of hippie bikers in um, the Carpathian uh, region. Um, so hippies saw actually rural life in a way uh, how most urban uh, people of the Soviet Union never did. Um, but on the other hand, they didn't use this knowledge uh, to come to any uh, societal conclusion. The true escape happened not only through running away from her participation in Soviet life, but into escaping into a space saturated with un-Soviet music, un-Soviet substances, and un-Soviet emotions. Um, so here's an example of un-Soviet music. This is the band Robini, which was a one of the most famous bands in Moscow in the early 70s, exclusively a cover band, sang only in English, didn't speak a word of English. Here is uh, one of the sessions. Um, I can't actually make quite head or tail of the writing. It's, it means something like Russians are not for rent, but it's misspelled. Um, but uh, you can see it's a so-called session and, and the police are there also to, to already disperse um, people. As hippies elsewhere, hip, Soviet hippies wanted to escape into another dimension. They knew that this was part and parcel of Western hippiedom, but they could also reach into a Soviet tradition of drug taking. Indeed, the first big drug was morphine, which had already been all the craze in the 1920s. In the 1960s, morphine was a habit of privileged youngsters who had a connection into scientific institutions. Indeed, available on the Soviet market continued to shape Soviet hippie drug taking. Since the Soviet health system was a free upon the point of delivery system, it was geared towards minimizing patient-doctor contact. That meant that a lot of heavy drugs were available without prescription. In the early 1970s, the health ministry noted with concern that high doses of codeine were easily available and proposed to mix unpleasant substances into the mixture in order to curb the abuse. Hippie favorites were dimidrol, ephedrine, and cyclodrol all of which were downers, yet when mixed with codeine or taken in large quantities, they could serve as uppers. Hippie communities became great knowledge communities of what to mix with what and what was available where. They would travel to more provincial places to clear the local pharmacies of what they offered, which then could be bartered for other substances. With drugs, they were not citizens of the Soviet Union anymore, caught within the borders of their own country, but they were supernatural entities, convening with spirits, God, or a world beyond. And here I'm also going to read you a short quote of an um, interview I did with a hippie who by that stage lived already in New York, but was amusing about his Moscow times. Um, yeah. Amphetamines I really liked and used a lot. Everything was then available without a prescription. I met the person who brought amphetamines to Moscow. We sat there at night and they said, we'll show you something interesting. And they made it into a big jar, about two or three liters, added some solution and some sediment appeared. What we drank was still a solution muddy from the manganese. It was a lot. They gave me a full glass. I drank it. And it was an absolutely magnificent event. Without side effects such as shaking or when you bite your lips or teeth, there was nothing like that. We talked to each other. What I liked about drugs was that one could talk about love, about God, and it was very nice all played on their instruments. It was an inspiration. Everything simply became amazing in this time. There was also, of course, um, which I think was always the quintessence of Soviet uh, drugs, um, a cleaning agent called Sopals, which was produced by the Latvian cleaning uh, Riga chemical combinat, um, and it produced hallucinations. Um, and hallucinations, of course, were the ultimate escape from politics. And here is another quote from a Tallinn hippie called Kest, um, who was a big mystic. Sopals, even the common one with white and red caps, Tallinn hippies also knew some kind of special black cap Sopals, provided telepathy on a physical level, to such a level that it was possible to read the newspaper with one's ass. I once sat in my boiler room on a bench with a piece of newspaper under my bottom. Suddenly I realized that my behind was somehow wet. What is this? All is dry, no liquid on the bench. I sit down again, adjust the paper, and again it's wet. I check the paper, it is dry. But my eye catches the title of the article, Flooding in China. And now all becomes clear. I sat on exactly on this article, and in this way, felt the very real substance of the physical topic of this article. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you can see there are many escapes um, available. What mattered, of course, were not floods in China, but the sensation of sopals. The most trusted agent of other world leaders became, however, muck. Um, Actually, sorry, I just, this is actually, I, I, I did want to speak about uh, um, LSD. Um, there was only one person who had access to LSD in the Soviet Union. It's this hippie called Shamil, and supposedly this is a picture taken under the influence, and I think one can believe it. Um, and he distributed uh, freely among his friends, um, but apart from him, nobody else uh, interviewed had a good experience because they always took it in far too large quantities and then got frightened about his trips, which lasted about five days. Um, <laughs> So they, they went back to is, what is the, um, the most common of, of um, Soviet drugs, um, muck, which is uh, derived uh, from the resin of the poppy flower bud. And this was seriously addictive and had the paradoxical effect that it both removed hippies far from Soviet reality, while at the same time exposing them to the dark underbelly of Soviet society. Drug, druggy hippies tended to stay inside their apartments, traveling only for feeding their addiction. And this is actually um, a, a drawing, um, oops, a drawing uh, one of the hippies did on an expedition uh, where they were supposed to help archaeologists to excavate um, some Bronze um, Age things. Uh, but the hippies realized there was a poppy field nearby and so they went and as you can see they harvested a poppy and then cooked, actually not muck, but kukna, which is a very strong tea with that substance. Um, and about a week later they were thrown out of the expedition. Um, because they weren't doing any excavating. Um, but of course, what started as a sort of um, entertainment and was quite funny did actually descend in, uh, into addiction. Um, and in the 1980s, monk users also found themselves confined for forced rehabilitation in psychiatric hospitals, where they encountered other and from voluntary inmates as well as the full brutality of Soviet psychiatry. Some of the friendships between hippies and political dissidents, interestingly, date from these joint time spent in psychiatric hospitals. Um, and here is another sort of um, illustration of, um, uh, of drugs and, and hippies. Uh, this is a drawing by a guy called Asocello, and you see he has a syringe in his pocket, uh, which is of course the, the syringe for the muck. But the pocket also has another an additional eye, so the, the, the drug is giving you more, more vision. Um, and he, he's striding into, into something into sort of fairy tale lands, which sometimes also called stone land. Or, um, but it illustrates quite well that the drugs basically allowed hippies to, to live in, in this, this version of themselves, where they were knights um, empowering and, and uh, walking, walking towards castles or mountains um, or other things. So while drugs provide the speedway to escape, other escapes were slower but more effective in creating a distinctive counter-community. The most important difference hippies felt towards the rest of society was that they felt differently. They rejected the official emotional regime of the late Soviet Union, at least partially, and created their own universes of feel. Love, of course, especially love towards friends, featured very highly. Touch of other people and kindness towards strangers were all viewed with suspicions in a country that had suffered so much internal strife and betrayal. Andrew Greenberg, who was one of the early Riga hippies, describes his first love in Riga, where he and his friends painted flowers on people's faces and hugged them. Most of the people reacted with shock and horror. I suspect they would have in the West as well. But those who allowed themselves to be taken in by this other emotional world were enchanted by the world of warmth. And I want to read um, also. Um, passage here by the sister of one of Moscow's main hippies um, who also was in the community but unlike him then didn't become a drug user. In the beginning I of course liked this creative atmosphere when you enter a different life, when we met at other people's home, everybody is a brother to you, everybody treats you like a king, like a relative that is understood, but even more like a king. They put you the whole time on a pedestal no matter what kind of education you are had. They bestowed on you this admiration, this warmth. I love you as you are. They safeguarded this internal love because they did not have any other love. Everyone had problems in the family, with parents, not to speak of their problems with society. They warmed each other with their own love. But she then gets more disenchanted um, because she sees how drugs um, destroy this initial community. Um, sorry, no one. The later religious dissident Alexander Agorodnikov described his generation's nurture as the escapees from a Soviet reality that smacked of moral compromise with a regime few 
believed in. And I want to read that to you too, if I find it. Oh no, I have it here. Hippies were lost children, runaways from Soviet families um, who thought of themselves as beacon of Western pop civilization and the morass of reality that surrounded them. Their soft key Soviet citizens were shadows of their party administrative offices. The idea which was impossible under Soviet conditions was to create communes where they could save themselves from all evil. So this idea of, of hippies, actually hippie community as healing, as um, as, as being a, a, a physical place um, for, for safeguarding people who were too um, sensitive for the rest of um, society. But of course it all ends up um, as escapism and of course the last but uh, not least escapism was the one of faith, spirituality um, and uh, belief. Um, this was, uh, you could actually almost take any kind of uh, spirituality you, you wanted. Uh, some of them, as you have seen in previous pictures, went the esoteric route. Some uh, went the Christian route. So this is pictures from Gaua, where people regularly got baptized, sometimes several years in a row. Um, and some um, even went into Islam um, or into other spiritualisms, such as uh, Hare Krishna movements. Um, and all of this could be um, lived together as, as well as apart. So my last section is why hippies lived long but changed little. And here was the crux of Soviet hippiedom. The direction of escape was clear and perfected over the years. But it was not clear what was going to take its place. Hippiedom was always about vagueness. The few times hippies tried to define themselves, the net was always cast very broadly. The same was true in the West, where some hippies followed decidedly escapist desires, including escapes into rural life, while others advocated a political path. This very fact spelled the end of the powerful hippie movement already in the mid-1970s. It simply splintered and developed into a myriad of directions giving birth to modern environmentalism as well as Silicon Valley computer geeks. The Soviet hippie movement was much more stable. As you can see, it goes well up into the 80s and I would argue possibly to the end and beyond of the Soviet Union. It ran through several generations and was still strong when Perestroika started to change Soviet society radically. It remained a coherent movement, a sistema, fraught with a few schisms, but if anything, uniting ever more youngsters under its umbrella. Even in the, the, in the West, widely opposed movements of punks and hippies had a common umbrella in the Soviet Union. This coherence and longevity was due to two factors. First, there was a stable enemy in the face of the Soviet system. Persecution remained high under any Soviet leader. Even in 1987, hippies were still arrested when they were demonstrating for free speech. So you always had an other against which you could um, define yourself. And second, the hippie vagueness and great escape let many possible divisive topics remain unexplored. So unlike in the West where hippies confronted political dissidents, gender, feminism, the question of pacifism, and empire and nationalism, none of this was ever addressed within the Soviet hippie community. It was clear that this um, was a very broad church, and later in the during perestroika, and then when the Soviet Union fell apart, it became clear that hippies had been nationalists, religious people, liberal, artists, bikers, and many things more. And then there was a third factor. I call it the lost in translation. Soviet hippies were a translation of American hippies. What did not fit was manipulated. So for example, also the question of war and peace. Clearly, when it comes to one of the cornerstones of American um, hippie identity, the um, opposition to the Vietnam War, the Soviet hippies just adopted it. At the same time, when it came to the cornerstone of Soviet identity, the valorization of the victory in the Great Fatherland Wars, the Second World War, as a foundation of Sovietness, hippies did not dare to oppose that. The hippie opposition to the Vietnam War was directly adopted and then forgotten, but not transferred into its equivalent. So for example, Dimitri Futaman, child of a high-ranking naval family in Sevastopol, gave me the following answer when I asked him about Vietnam. The war in Vietnam. I wore a badge. Somebody had given it to me, saying I'm against the war in Vietnam. But that was like on another planet. Nobody discussed the war in Vietnam. Many had to go to the army at that time and many tried to escape conscription. I had to go into the army when I was 20. 
I do not discuss, I remember discussions that were anti-army. Everyone understood when there's a war, there was no point in resisting the army because everybody supported it. Of course, the Red Army had defeated fascism. That was good. In other armies, we just knew little about the Vietnam War. And uh, his answer is, is echoed um, by other people um, basically keeping the Soviet army intact while on the surface um, adhering to pacifist beliefs. But sometimes uh, they could take even quite some funny um, contradictions. So this is a letter written to Sonse by a hippie called um, Zaloviev. And um, he writes, so this is, this is the original letter I read you, an expert. Take a look at the map and you see that I'm three kilometers from the ocean. We are standing here firmly and no matter how much they, meaning the Chinese, will sneak across the border with their propaganda or machine guns, nothing will come of it. Bastards. I curse the Far East and Primorje where I serve, but when I think that guys like me die for nothing, struck by their filthy bullets that their stinky legs can step up on our land, my blood boils. Bastards, bastards, lousy little bastards, narrow-shouldered creatures, dark, dirty, along with their fucked-up mouth. I have no words. One desire is to grab my machine gun and shoot, shoot, shoot them there until no one, no one narrow-eyed bastards remains in this world. And as you can see, he has adored this letter with lots of hippies and words of flowers and um, love signs. So, um, there were some attempts to protest the war in Afghanistan. Um, this is a picture from uh, Leningrad. Um, but the legacies of this protest is highly disputed um, and it certainly wasn't a very big. So hippies in Russian society today. So where does this leave us regarding Russian society today? What does it mean for the Soviet hippie impact on the world? First of all, Soviet hippies did have an impact, just as American hippies left Hippies left the world differently in ways which became only visible many ways, many years after they stopped being a phenomenon. The same was true for Soviet hippies. Just as Soviet hippies changed over the decades, so did Soviet society. And one could argue that Soviet society became more hippieish. Certainly in terms of fashion, what was unacceptable in the late 1960s had become standard bohemian look by the late 1970s. Rock music was partially legalized, and by the late 1980s, bands such as Kino and Machina Vrimini packed whole football stadiums. I would argue that the survival skill of Soviet hippies were also largely adopted or developed in parallel with the great escape by Soviet hippies. The flight into alternative spaces is still characteristic of much of Soviet society, may that be Dutchers or the arts, which once again were declared apolitical. Life running parallel rather than counter the Soviet system became the norm rather than the exception. People's serviceness became so hidden under their everyday as initially not even being recognizable as such. The demise of the Soviet superstructure was hence also greeted more with a shrug of the shoulders than with great sorrow. Indeed, the whole idea that politics is dirty and that pure souls do not dabble in politics survived much longer than the short period of perestroika activism, which also engulfed the hippie community. So for example, in 1987, there was a demonstration under the Gogol Monument in Moscow for free speech. And the first big demonstration in Lviv was partly co-organized by the local hippies. But for example, so this is a call to the June the 1st Tsaritsyn meetings, which you will soon see in a film, um, by Yuva Divasan, who in fact was one of the more politicized hippies. Um, but in the right-hand corner, you can see the following, and um, here's a quote from 1968 from New York. Um, we don't have to take part in all of the um, swineries happening in their society. And um, it's then 1992, which is the year the, the poster was made, of saying, um, let's continue the silence. Uh, that's the, that's the, the general message. Um, so silence, rather than speaking out, was valorized um, as something that was um, more pure and um, more sophisticated. In the former republics, especially to the west of Russia, hippie history chimed well with the new narrative of nation building. Having political views and having been anti-Soviet was a badge of honor there and remains so. Russian hippies and Russian society at large do not quite know what to do with the stories of dissent they certainly also have. Many Russian hippies now agree with Putin that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a geopolitical catastrophe. Their own role in it makes them uneasy. It goes so far that one hippie even told me that he believed that Soviet hippies, uh, of which he had been a leader, were as creation of the CIA in order to weaken the Soviet Union. While not so extreme, the vast majority of Russian hippies escapes now even more than into the 
more than ever into the mantra of the apoliticalness of the youthful pursuits. That too has made a career in Russian society at large. People are happiest when they can put distance between themselves and dirty political business. They do not only accept lack of agency, they covet it. Because it bestows on them the purity of artistic and soulful pursuits. So this is especially true, I think, for the cultural elite in many ways. The fact that Soviet hippies remained vague in their definition and only determined in their feel and emotion meant that their many different churches found a home under their roof. While not so noticeable in Soviet times, the post-Soviet years flushed out as heterogeneity. There are now former hippies supporters of Putin, Schnur, for example, of the band Leningrad, and Galek Sukhachov, who made a film about Sonsen, as well as opponents, for example, um, Artemy Troitsky, the famous rock critic, um, or people like Alexander Ivanov, who is one of Navalny's organizers. But they are the outliers. The vast mass hides in their VNP-powered Facebook groups, discussing old rock legends as if nothing happened. From time to time, they let slip that they are following the news, but they rather discuss the pet rescue stories of this current war than Butcher or Isyom. Another segment has not bothered with EVPM. They too are unlikely to be active proponents of the war. But they share an acceptance that whatever made them different that not, does not call them to arms now. On the contrary, their learned practices tell them that their salvation is in the establishment of spaces that do not fight Putin, but which pretend that there is no Putin. And no politics overall. They do not feel responsible for the war, just as they did not feel responsible for the Soviet Union, even though so many of their parents had been members of the nomenclatura. Telling me when I announced this talk on my Facebook page, a Lithuanian hippie now living in Jerusalem commented on the abstract with a provocative short riff on how the Russian hippies were really quite happy with the Soviet setup, only asserting their right to rock music and to get stoned. But in essence, he claims they were fine with all that made up the foundation, the empire, the ideology, and the system of repression. This caused a furious response from some of the Moscow hippies who praised as hippie virtues their studied our politicalness. Both sides claimed greater hippie authenticity. While the particular personalities did not know each other back in the days, there has been much socializing between Baltic and Ukrainian hippies with their Russian peers. But the war which started in 2014 exposed these differences mercilessly. And as an end, I want to show you um, a few minutes of a, Russian doc of a documentary on Soviet hippies of which I was a co-producer and the director was an um, Estonian called Terje Tumistu. Um, and now I hope I find it. Um, I'm not a PC user, so... <laughs> okay. Um, so I show you the very beginning and the very end. Ты, вот, как-то, ты нахуй. 
семейства, мы... Почему они в Москве, идиоты, не делают никаких демонстраций против войны в Украине? Почему они не выходят на улицы, как когда-то наши ровесники в, в Америке, против войны во Вьетнаме? Что это такое? Как бы такой вот минус свободы, видите, 
Thank you very much. I'm, that was, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, so the floor, I have many myself, but the floor is now open, so please raise your hand and there's a microphone coming around. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this like, fantastic talk. Um, I do have uh, two, two questions, please. Uh, first of all, I'm curious if there were any interactions or uh, writing letters, <laughs> making phone calls between the Soviet hippies and the ones from the West. Any kind of uh, I don't know, feedback that they were getting from the West? I'm just curious because, of course, they were looking as, at them as role models. And then, could you say a little bit more about the background of the people from this movement? Because you kind of hinted, pointed, in the saying like, this one was from this family, this one from the other one. But if you'd have to make a profiling of them, who were the people? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's actually a favorite topic. I have another talk on these Western contacts. Um, they, they, they were, I mean, they were far in between, and um, some Soviet hippies never saw Western in their, in their life, but most of them saw hippies from Poland um, or other um, Soviet bloc countries um, who could come, but um, especially hippies in Moscow uh, did mostly meet at some point in their life um, somebody from West Germany or um, England um, or America, and. Um, the songs, I, I was just actually telling the, the story that um, I had this amazing experience. So after I actually worked for seven years on, on this project and I had thought a lot about songs and what motivated him, etc. I finally found his brother and I interviewed him. And before we even started, he put a box on the table and said, this is all that's left from my brother. And it was full of these autobiographical writing and letters and um, an address box. And from his address book, I can reconstruct that he knew people all over the place. Um, and in the age of Google, I started Googling these people and seeing if they would tell me something from the other side, and some of them responded. Um, and one actually had a sort of kind of um, small affair with, with, with Sonse, and she then sent like, me her diary of the time when she met the Soviet hippies by accident on, on Gorky Street, um, and um, couldn't believe that they, 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 she thought that they were making fun of it because they were saying, oh, this is Stalin's grandson, and she's like, oh, well, surely not, uh, but yes, it was. Um, so, and I, I can see she then sent me pictures of herself from the time, and I, I could see that for, for them it must have been a, a sort of a huge event of finally seeing one of these, these hippies and Flash, and she of course called herself Freak, and there's sort of lots in her diary, I can see there's sort of kind of misunderstandings, um, like the, um, translation doesn't doesn't quite um, quite work so she's completely blown away by the fact that all these hippies are sleeping in two very uncomfortable beds and, and she's like but they're really freakish and but of course the the local hippies were blown away by the trousers one of these guys uh, was wearing in fact he didn't get let into the Lenin mausoleum the day after because uh, with such trousers you were not allowed to go um, so there, there, there is that, but um, it's, it's fleeting, and the interesting thing is that I think it's very important in the early years, and then later, of course, because in the West, um, hippiedom isn't such a thing anymore, they sort of kind of realize in the mid-70s that they're on their own, and um, especially because some people actually emigrate uh, to America, there's a hippie couple also from Moscow who gets thrown out, um, uh, and they end up in, in San Francisco and Los Angeles and they write letters back and they're quite disenchanted uh, with the West and, and also they write back, there are no hippies here. Um, and that's of course is, is a shock, but in the end actually it, it facilitates um, what I would say is the Sovietization. So in the, in the beginning it's very much about imitation and then from about 73, 74 onwards you can see how they're starting to build up these mechanisms which actually make them very resilient in Soviet society. And that goes into your second question that, yes, initially a lot of these children are from privileged backgrounds. Certainly in Moscow, where you have um, a lot of them concentrated in the um, journalism faculty of Moscow State University, which in itself was uh, the most prestigious faculty where you basically only got in by connections and um, so all the children of other foreign correspondents. Um, then one girl, her mother was a KGB undercover agent in Oxford um, in the later 40s um, and then now was teaching English to 
um, cosmonauts and, um, and, and secret agents. Um, then one guy was the stepson of uh, Brezhnev's English translator, and so really highest nomenklatura. Um, but they always were normal people, and as actually interestingly, as the movement becomes more Sovieticized and more sort of a Soviet phenomenon, um, the nomenklatura uh, children mostly break away, not all of them, um, and it becomes a much more representative of at least urban Soviet society. So I think, but I can say from the mid 70s onwards, it's not anymore only super privileged uh, people, even though some of them remain in the movement and also continue coming back in the, in the 80s. But I think um, the pull back for them, of course, was much more um, in, enticing. So I, I first of all, also their families got into trouble when, um, I mean, once the persecution started, there was a lot of pressure put onto their parents. And the higher up the parents were, the, the more pressure could be put on them. So some of them sort of stopped being hippish to, to safeguard their parents. And, and others um, just basically took advantage of what that kind of position as a, of a privileged child could offer them and then sort of drifted away um, from it. So some of the very early hippies who I know by hearsay I could never find, um, especially women who had changed their name because they had been so sucked up back into, into, into um, nomenclatura society. Um, thank you, Liana, for an absolutely fascinating uh, lecture. Um, could you say a bit about any connections that might have been active, or at least implied, with earlier phases of the influence of American Western culture into Soviet youth culture? So I'm thinking, of course, of the Stiyagi, the beatniks of the 1950s who had come out of, you know, the young men who had come out of the Second World War, and possibly even the pre-war period as well. I mean, I don't know if High Stalinism allowed any such influence at all, or whether it had to wait for the thaw. Uh, what are the precedents, uh, antecedents, rather, to be heard? Yeah, I was very interested in that uh, initially, um, and I, I kept on saying, did you know Stigagi, etc., and I was always very disappointed that nobody seemed to, to get their influence from there. There were a couple of uh, cases where elderly, older brothers had been um, Stigagi, or very often Fatsovshiki, so, um, in that sort of surroundings, you went then from selling dandy-like clothing to selling hippie clothing. That sort of was seamless. Um, but in general, I mean, what is interesting about the hippies, it is indeed the first youth subculture that consciously makes reference to the West. Um, has the same name, um, wants to be a part of the same global community. That wasn't true for the Stilagi. So even though in the Stilagi you can see the Sassus and the Halbstarke and, and all sorts of phenomena around Europe, which look very similar and clearly caused by similar sort of dynamics of uh, veterans versus younger generation, etc. Um, they don't see it of themselves as, as, as a homogeneous entity, and, and the hippies do. And, and that reference back to the international community that, as I say, that dies down a little bit in the mid-70s to mid-80s, but then it comes back with a vengeance in the late 80s when I discovered as the anti-nuclear movement and they, they start to reconnect um, via that. Also, however, with various degrees. Um, but the sort of ideas that somehow they transcend the national boundary and that makes them somehow both cooler but be also better and freer, that was an idea that never left them. And I think the idea that sort of somehow they, they form a community with someone else um, on the other side of the world or on the other side of the Iron Curtain it was a very important element of their, sustain of their self sustainability. Thank you for a very interesting talk. It seems to me one of the characteristics of hippies in the United States was anti-capitalism. Um, and I agree, I mean, I think your point about they ultimately become kind of dead-ended and apolitical because they become insular and, you know, style, et cetera, becomes the focus. But I'm wondering how that part translated, right? Um, since I think that was very explicitly part you know, a rejection of capitalist values as part of the hippie movement. And I'm wondering, that seems like a difficult translation, unless it's just being anti-establishment. And I was wondering if you could say something about that. 
Uh, I guess so I would add like hippie commune is a term in the United States. It doesn't play the same way, right, in a Soviet context. So I'd love to hear more about that. Thanks. No, it's, it's really interesting because um, it, there were so many, there were so many of these uh, contradictions where actually really the, the hippie creed did not uh, fit particularly well. I mean, Vietnam, as I said, was one of them, and the anti-materialist culture and a society which was sort of um, not super materialist um, was a difficult one. But it's interesting. So they did different strategies to 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 get around different contradictions. So Vietnam, they kind of ignored, uh, and in a way, of course, it was more comfortable to be anti-Vietnam um, and not be uh, not to have to be anti-Soviet at the same time. So, um, and as I say, it doesn't translate into a concerted anti-Afghanistan movement, which would have been the the obvious one. Even though I mean, I, I wouldn't say it was completely there. Is evidence that people did right things or did go on small demonstrations, but nothing nothing than, than one would, could um, expect, so nothing on the scale of the 1971 demonstration. So in the anti-capitalism, they much liked all these anti-capitalist stories which came over, so the famous one of, I think, Jerry Rubin um, throwing dollars, I um, want dollar notes down the New York Stock Exchange and the traders scrambling to, to pick up these dollar notes. That made it, I think that was in the Pravda article, or I mean, anyway, it was a, a story well known among the hippies and they thought it was always really cool. And um, how it then translated into the Soviet, I mean, obviously, uh, with so many privileged parents, they had a certain kind of, there was definitely an anti that sort of generational conflict of, um, I don't want to enter in the same kind of lies as my parents. Um, that was quite strong and something which is downplayed in interviews now and is much more obvious in the sources that come out from the time. And I think it's because over time, obviously, this anti this sort of generational conflict has mellowed down and now they feel sorry about their elderly parents if they even are still alive. But I think that was generally something that somehow they couldn't quite enter into that same antagonism because their parents weren't so wealthy and they're also their parents, even though they were nomenclatura, it was very clear that they could be demoted at any time, that they lived in a system where um, they, they were nothing by themselves. As soon as their, their place in the system was shifting, they, they, they would be just as powerless as their children. And that shines through in, in the interviews. You, by necessity, and I, I actually, in the chapter I have on that, I make that argument that uh, it was one of the things where actually Soviet hippies fit really well with Soviet society, but being anti-materialist is great in a society which doesn't have much materialism. So. <laughs> If, you, if you're not into buying expensive Western clothing, but you're happy and sort of like um, tailoring your own jeans and finding a button on the street and thinking that's destiny and that has to be the button on your jeans, that's much better for a society where you don't have many choices of buttons and jeans. So, um, in many ways, the, the kind of ideology that chimed well with the reality they lived in, and so they could be both anti-materialist in a very anti-materialist society and still be very different, because what they didn't embrace was the sort of properness. Um, and ironically, I, mean, I have this one picture of a hippie couple getting married in, in one of the wedding palaces in Leningrad, and the lady from Saks, the lady who does the wedding, has this enormous two-page hair and is very made up. And she actually looks like a female Stelyaga of the 1950s, 60s, like what would have been absolutely forbidden in the 50s, 60s. But in the 70s, that was the accepted look. But the people she married were basically two long-haired youngsters. Um, and in fact, I know the story behind, she kicked them out first and said that, that the man had to cut his hair, otherwise she wouldn't do the marriage ceremony. Um, so you, you, you see it sort of, it's, it's shifting. I mean, basically they reject that, that properness that has that arrived in a more affluent society in the 50s and 60s, even though the society still wasn't very affluent. Um, so it was a very, very tricky negotiation of what they could have and what they couldn't have and what made sense. But yeah, it's something I thought about a lot over the years. Maybe I'll ask my question if I can share in the So my question, I was thinking about, um, in Russian Soviet history, other examples of subcultures or youth movements and uh, for example, the nihilists of the 1860s were very politically and ideologically engaged and actually had a huge influence, whereas the um, Tolstoyan intelligentsia communes and uh, communities of the early 20th century and sectarians withdrew and escaped but had almost no broader influence. But you describe a kind of escapism subculture that you say actually had this really broad 
influence. And so I wonder how that worked. Is it because Soviet society is under reflecting the same trends that affect the hippie community, or is it somehow the hippie subculture actually uh, affects the broader society? Yeah, um, interesting. Um, and then, of course, interesting because, of course, the hippies were fans of the Tolstoyans, and at least some of them were real Tolstoyan disciples. But in general, it, it, it was one of the sort of texts and ideas that were circulating. Among them. So how, how did they achieve influence even though they, they went into this sort of escapism? I mean, I think part of this is what you already suggested. Um, other forms of escapism arrived independently because basically Soviet society had come to that point where on the one hand it allowed the creation of these alternative spaces. So it wasn't quite as restrictive anymore as under Stalin and also it wasn't as invigorated anymore as it had been maybe in the 20s and 30s and possibly even 50s when the fall you have a sort of revival um, so it's definitely a post for society, I think, is one. But the other thing is that um, even though the hippies themselves were a small band, um, by sort of doing things like organizing these music sessions, being in, very intimately linked with rock music, and of course rock music makes this huge career in the later Soviet Union, um, they sort of become a sort of um, lighthouse function. Um, they sort of say, okay, here is the marker, so far can you go? because these people have tested it out. And if they go further, they end up in a psychiatric hospital, which they frequently do. Um, so I think this is, this is sort of, they, they map out the territory of Soviet citizens, especially a young Soviet citizen today this way. I think, you know, for Babushka in the village, there, there was no hippie influence. Even though, of course, the Babushka sells them, sold them the, um, the poppy butts. So they made a, there was a real problem. They made a thriving business. And um, I, I know that from the Ukrainian KGB archive, where they even, we're thinking about sending people around and telling the Babushkas not to talk to the hippies anymore. So it's, um, it's, it, it is, but obviously the, the sort of kind of lighthouse function, I think, is for, for youth. But then if they did that for basically had this lighthouse function, let's say, for at least 15 years by 1985, um, that's, that's a lot of youth to, to, to influence. And I think that is sort of becoming apparent then with Perestroika and, and the, the sort of 90s, um, just how important this thema was after all, even though it sort of looks on the first glance there's a bunch of hippies and some of them got persecuted and some of them stopped being hippies and then in Perestroika they all fell apart and nothing is left. Um, but I find it even now interesting to see when people pop up um, and um, you, you can trace them back to the Soviet hippie community and for example, is, um, What's his name? Um, famous director who got um, house arrest um, and then made the film called Lieta. It's Omar. Sergei. Sergei. Yeah, Zerbenikov. Um, why does he feel the need in, in, in 2017 or 18 to, to make this, this film about uh, the, the subculture and about the sort of the systema and the kind of feel of, 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 of the systema? So clearly, um, people think that this is. This is something which tells them something still. And, and I think actually we still haven't quite seen the end of it because now that conditions are created which actually are much more similar to conditions in the late Soviet period, I'm sort of kind of interested to see what, what kind of youth culture is coming out. And I mean, there's this guy who got so terribly arrested and, and raped. He, he did a rap poem at the Mayakovskaya. So going back to the Mayakovskaya, to this place of where poets already assembled in the 50s and 60s, and I'm sure there was no coincidence. Um, but he recorded it on social media, so it's, it's different. I think that's a great time to end on that note. We will see what happens. Please join me uh, thanking you a lot.